Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good night. It's already here in where I am in the Netherlands. It's uh, six o'clock in the evening, so it's about twelve o'clock somewhere in in East Asia. Welcome all of you. We have we are uh, now uh, entering the last part of the of the of the meeting, the last uh, series of presentations, and um, we are in the in number two of the lightning talks on frigivory seed dispersal and fruit seed trades, ecology and conservation. We have eight presentations to go. My name is Franz Bongers and I'm from Wageningen University and I'm very happy to be here, to be your moderator. So please use the Q&A in the screen um, of uh, Zoom to put your questions and um, that will be nice. Um, I think that is about it. Maybe when the when the video starts, close your cameras and close your your microphones after the video. It's about forty minutes, I, I guess, with eight presentations. We come back and we have a lively discussion, and the audience is there. They're all excited to uh, to hear your presentation. So enjoy it with me. And uh, I think that's it for the moment. Thank you, Marcelo. You can start it. See you in half an hour. Hi, everybody. I'm Juliana. I'm a master's degree student of a college from Universidade Estadual de Campinas. And today I will talk about the effect of population size on long distance dispersal by an endangered macaw. According to the planetary boundaries concept, the laws of biodiversity has already transgressed the typing point considered safe for life on Earth. And the deformation acts deeply in this process, mainly by extinguishing species populations, contracting their ranges of distributions, and through local declines in population abundance. So, the ecological response of the foundation included more than extinguishing species. Um, as the cascading effects, functional and ecosystem service extinctions, even before the loss of species, when large wildlife were removed, for example. And one of the vertebrate groups most threatened by this contest are parrots, uh, once they have uh, their populations declining dramatically in the neotropic and they often prey on seeds, so they were considered antagonists to the plants they interact with. And recently, when some studies pointed to their role as mutualists in many of these interactions, and now there is evidence that they can ingest viable seeds, spurs propagose through stomachocery and waste intact seeds, which place them as promoters of seed dispersal. Besides, they great mobility and wide home hands make them potentially important also in long distance dispersal. So, how much could the foundation affect plant parrots interactions? Um, here we sought to quantify one of these interesting relationships between seed dispersal interactions and change in the population size of an endangered macaw. The Lear's macaw is endemic in a small part of northeastern Brazil, with populations to mates ranging from 60 to 2,000 individuals since its discovery four years ago. The liquid palm has a cortical dispersal, and under its trees, dozens of uh, propagos accumulate, as in this photograph. And the liquid is the main food of this macaw. Um, these birds can fly about 45 kilometers from their host sites to their feeding areas, and these feeding areas are spread in small patches and uh, unfortunately are not under protection. Macau is a predator of the liquid seeds, but they are often seen carrying uh, the fruits across the feeding areas and sometimes even to the nesting grounds. Then, to obtain quantitative estimates of the potential effects of the phonation, we model this interaction as a multi-stage process under dif uh, different Macau's population abundance scenarios. 
and we look at the quantitative and qualitative subcomponents of such parcel, as well as representative variables in these interactions. Uh, we adapted uh, endosocoric flow chart for the stomatography process. And later, we used an individual based model similar to the one developed for the megafauna seed dispersal by peers and co authors. And here, in each individual in the population of Macau, performs a foraging event with a chance to perform a stomatography event. And animal movement was simulated in models where individuals can move in any direction after removing bands of liquid. In the end, we will be 10 potential seed dispersal kernels. Uh, simulating seed dispersal with different Macau population densities from 15 to 2,000 individuals, we found few changes in the shape of seed dispersal kernels. Uh, but when we look more closely at the tail of the distributions in the graph on the right, what we see is that the frequency of long distance seed dispersal events increase considerably with population size. The frequency of LDD events is more than 20 times higher in a population of 1,000 compared to one of 50 individuals. This difference increases more in the scenarios of the greatest abundance. The ma maximum dispersal distance is also much greater on average in simulations with large populations. Um, to conclude, the depletion of parrots populations from a broader perspective can have consequences for the plant metal population dynamics, others, others consumers, and secondary dispersers. So we hope the Lear Macau's population could be big enough to promote their ecological functions. Thanks. <laughs>
estimation of seed collection time for Saurawea microphylla were December and June, Simawali GE was November, and Casanopsis argentea was February. Casanopsis argentea has a bigger and heavier seed than others, so that the number of seed per kilogram less than Sima Walici and Saurawia microphylla. The fruit type of local species in this study classified into nut for Castanopsis argentea, berry for Saurawia microphylla, and capsules for Sima Walici. This is the documentation about the type of fruit and seed size. Germination rate of the local species in this study classified into slow germinated seed for Castanopsis argentea and the faster was Sima Walici. Recommendation Peak seasons of flowering fruiting can suggest the best time of seed collection. Differences of physical physiological seeds properties can be considered in conducting seed handling, seed processing, and possibilities of seed storage. The result of this study will provide some recommendations on the possibilities of the free local species in terms of planting strategies, seedling production in nurseries, and opportunities for implementing direct seeding on the restoration target area. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi there, I'm Adam Fell, a PhD student at the University of Stirling. I'm going to talk to you about a systematic review I have recently been carrying out on frugivorous animal tracking studies and the estimation of seed dispersal distances. Functional connectivity of plants and forests as a whole are primarily affected by how the organisms respond to changes in the landscape structure and composition. Therefore, changes to frugivore communities can negatively affect the recruitment success of plants and ultimately forest succession and regeneration. My publication search resulted in a total of 148 different studies that track the movements of frugivorous animals between 1978 and 2020. The tracking involved either GPS tags, radio transmitters or resource tracking. These publications were then split into whether they used the tracking data to estimate seed dispersal distances or not. As you can see, around 2008, we see an influx of studies using GPS tags, which corresponds with an increase in the number of studies that start to estimate seed dispersal distance. On this map, we can see that a large proportion of these studies are typically undertaken within tropical biomes, but there are also a large number present in the temperate forests around Europe and North America. There are still large proportions of terrestrial areas which are yet to be explored by tracking technology, likely due to the lack of resources and facilities for field work. As a result of this, we see a clustering of studies in hotspots where research stations are situated. In total, 155 different species were tracked across the studies, with 84 being bird species and 66 being mammals. Of these mammal species, 47% were either bat or flying fox species. Only 23% of species had repeated studies, suggesting that we are basing a lot of animal behaviour assumptions on analysis from just a few individuals. Even though there was a wide range of species studied across the publications, the median weight of birds and mammals tagged was relatively small. The same is true for the median weight of species tagged with radio transmitters, whilst larger species are more likely to be tagged with GPS tags. The median weight of birds and mammals tagged by GPS units was larger than that of animals tagged by radio transmitters, despite advances in technology and miniaturisation of tracking units. In total, 33 studies used GPS units, 104 used radio transmitters, and 12 used resource tracking methods. Of the studies reviewed here, the mean number of tags deployed per species per study was 16.6. When separated into taxa, there was relatively no difference between the number of days tracking devices were recording for and the number of locations collected. 
GPS tags in general were deployed for much longer time periods than radio tags and were also responsible for collecting almost nine times the amount of data locations. We then focus on the studies which estimated sea dispersal distances for different species. A total of 61 studies calculated either the mean or maximum dispersal distance. We then modelled a number of different variables to see which significantly affected dispersal distances. Of these, we found that body mass had a significant effect on mean distance, with large animals dispersing seeds further. There are also smaller but significant positive effects of human footprint index values and whether the study was conducted in a protected area. As with mean distances, maximum distances were also shown to increase with body mass. However, we also see a large significant effect on whether the animal is able to fly or not. Those animals which fly tend to disperse seeds further than animals of similar body mass which cannot fly. There were also significant effects of taxa and protected areas, with mammals and studies undertaken in protected areas having larger maximum dispersal distances. Given that habitat fragmentation and disturbance drive changes in dispersal communities with knock-on effects for seed dispersal services, there is an increasing need to understand how effective seed dispersers are affected by local and landscape changes. By understanding the distance local species can transport seeds, corridors can be created to increase the potential of between patch seed dispersal, which in turn will increase diversity and support different communities. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Mariana Gelambi and I am a PhD student in the Weyhill Lab at Virginia Tech and my project is entitled Exploring the Effects of Fertigonal Metabolite on Bat Foraging. Plants produce an enormous diversity of phytochemicals. Historically, these phytochemicals have been classified as primary and secondary metabolites. Primary metabolites participate in central metabolism, where secondary metabolites are a structural diverse group of molecules that mediate ecological interactions, including herbivory, seed dispersal, and pollination. In a tiny sample of plant tissue, there can be hundreds and even thousands of secondary metabolites. Secondary metabolites have been primarily studied in leaves, where they protect the plants against pathogens and, her and herbivores. However, other plant tissues, like fruit, also have a wide variety of secondary metabolites. And the effect of these compounds on the physiology of fructivores have been largely overlooked. Therefore, the objective of my project is to explore the effects of fruit secondary metabolites on bat physiology and foraging. To accomplish that objective, I conducted several experiments at La Selva Biological Station in Costa Rica. I used bats from the genus Carolia, which participate in the seed dispersal process um, which is critical to maintain tropical forest diversity. Um, Carolia bat are considered piper specialist. Piper is um, a pioneer plant species that colonize forests during the early stages of regeneration. And specifically, I worked with um, Carolia perspicillata. I selected four secondary metabolites, piperin, eugenol, tannic acid, and phytol. These metabolites uh, naturally occur in piper fruit, and they are commercially available. I conducted behavior trials in a fly cage located in the middle of the forest, and I fed the bat with an artificial diet that had banana, protein powder, and supplements, and I individually added the four compounds I mentioned. I used 
trade concentrations, which are ecologically relevant. And pair each concentration, I, replicate, uh, I replicated the trials 10 times with 10 different bats. This is a clip of the bat eating the artificial diet in the cage. I found that overall, the fruit secondary metabolites tested disencouraged feeding especially phytyl and eugenol. First, I use a binomial model to test the effect of these metabolites in the participation of bats in the trial, and both phytyl and eugenol negatively affect if bats participated in the trials or not. Then I just worked with the bats that participated in the trials, and I also found that phytyl and eugenol negatively affect the amount of food consumed by the bats. So these results are consistent with the trader of hypothesis, which has stated that fruit secondary metabolites are primarily directed to pathogens and pests. Um, so they're protective fruit. However, they, it has an ecological, an ecological cost, and is that uh, they have a potential negative effect on frugivores. Thank you. Greetings everyone at the ATBC Virtual Meeting 2021. I welcome you to my lightning poster talk. I'm João Vitor Messeder, current Ecology PhD student and Fulbright Scholar at Penn State University. Today, I will present to you how my co-authors and I were able to identify the main keystone resources for neotropical frugivorous birds using a novel network approach and a thorough assessment of the functional traits conferring keystoneness. Here, on the right side of the screen, you can have an overview of my virtual poster. Derived from the keystone species concept, keystone plant resources are fleshy fruiting plants that can produce a large number of fruits to sustain many frugivorous animals. Their proper identification can directly help the development of better conservation and restoration management strategies. Here, we quantitatively identify which plants can be keystone and what are their functional attributes. We worked at the neotropical scale to investigate which genera among the 373 present in the networks could be a keystone. To do that, we gathered 38 networks and calculated for each plant species three complementary metrics that measure how connected a species is to its frugivorous partner, normalized degree, closeness and between the centrality. We water the species from high to low and select the top quartile of species. We then calculated the accumulated values for each plant genera represented for each centrality and selected the top 10. And then, based on the intersection, these genera were the main potential keystone resources. Now, to identify the contribution of the retrieved keystones for the stability of networks, we performed removal simulations targeted at the keystones and random removals and measured the changes on the structure in terms of nestedness, modularity, and issue overlap before and after the removal. Exemplifying here, if we remove the most consumed resource, we will have a reduction on the nested structure of the network. But the opposite would occur to the modular structure, where the keystone connects different parts of the network. As our first result, only six genera were retrieved as potential keystone resource, with Miconia obtaining the highest values for all three centrality metrics. When we compared the removal simulations, only species in Miconia significantly affected all three metrics more than expected by chance, reducing nestedness and niche overlap and increasing modularity. But what makes Miconia so special and appealing to the fruit groups? Miconia is a hyperdiverse neotropical genus belonging to Melastomatase. For the second objective, we retrieved free trait information, phenology, and frugivory records. As we can see here, Miconia produced berries with a variety of colors and shapes. 
with the majority represented by black and purple, with most animals consuming it irrespective to the color. The flesh berries are of small size, of around 0.5 cm with many small seeds, with a mean fruit crop size of 11,000 of fruits in a single individual, with some species producing over 150,000 fruits. The pulp is composed mainly by waters and sugars, with the sugars being composed by monosaccharides. In the circular plot here, with the months of the year around the circle, at the neotropical scale, a high number of species produce fruits each month, and in specific communities, species produce fruits in scarce periods, the dry season, and at non-seasonal habitat, species tend to fruit year-round. These mentioned attributes facilitate the consumption by an impressive taxonomic diversity of fruitfuls, as birds, mammals, ants, species, and reptiles, with none of these rare refraction curves here reaching a plateau, indicating that many more animals might use Mikonia fruits as a resource. In conclusion, only a handful of genera can be potential keystone resources, six out of a 373 genera, with Mikonia standing out as a major keystone resource, leading to drastic impacts on the network structure when removed. Mikonia high production of small-sized fruits constitute a reliable food resource for many animals. Thus, we hypothesize that using these keystones, especially Mikonia in restoration projects, one can maximize natural regeneration of increasingly fragmented landscapes in the Anthropocene. I would like to thank you, my co-authors, funding agents, and especially the ATBC committee for the opportunity. Thank you. Let's talk about fruit. But first, I want to acknowledge the contribution of my collaborators, Simon Quispo, Fabian Michelangeli, Susan Mason, and Maria El Pilar Malagón, and the coming from the committee of Quispo Love and the funding institutions. As well as we know, individual plants don't move, and to overcome this limitation, plants rely on dispersing seeds far from the model stream. In plants dispersed by animals, fruit traits are a product of selection by frugivores to facilitate dispersion. For instance, fruit size tend to be associated with different dispersers and constrained by frugivores' gape size. These constraints are more evident in the species dispersed by birds, when birds gape select from small and rounded shapes, favoring dispersion of fruit that can be easily eaten. That takes us to the adaptative allometry hypothesis. On one hand, fruit can have isometric increments in size, but producing large fruits that are harder to be ingested. Or alternative, fruit have allometric increments in size, with changes no equally proportional to using elongated fruits that are easy to be swollen. So to test this hypothesis, we work with the species of the Supracotea clay in Laudaisi. The species of these clays are, are commonly consumed and dispersed by birds. In previous studies in Costa Rica, chose some fruit had allometric increments in size, suggesting bird selection. However, those results did not provide information about whether the fruit shape is phylogenetically conserved, where related species have similar shapes, or it is constrained by ecology with habitats determining fruit shape. And those became our main questions. For that, and during this pandemic, we decided to use herbarium collection and information for literature. Thus, we gathered information for 460 species, 110 including a previous phylogeny, and 40 with detailed information about fruit length, diameter, and geographical location. An ancestral cell reconstruction for the length diameter ratio as a proxy for shape suggested that shape tend to be phylogenetically concerned, but similar shapes originated independently to the phylogeny. Here in blue, we have more elongated fruits. When we look at the correlation of increments in length and diameter and control for relentless, 
we still see an allometric increment, but an intermediate value of lambda suggests some, but no robot phylogenetically effect in the allometric. We found the same allometric increment when we include all the species and did not consider phylogenetic relatedness. The result suggests that relatedness may play a role in allometry, but other forces also affect fluid shape. To see whether ecological interaction with fluidivores determine shape, we use the, the geographical information to assign three types of folders as a proxy to fluidivores. Unfortunately, we don't have enough of species occurring in multiple ecosystems restricted of analysis at the species level. However, when we looked at shape between ecosystems, results shows that Caribbean fruits tend to be rounder than the Atlantic forest or the Amazon forest fruits, suggesting that factors like the type of forest play a role in fruit shape. So we can conclude that fruit shapes is allometric, is allometric in Suprocotea, with some effect of phylogenetic relatedness contributed to this allometry, and that Caribbean fruit tend to be rounder than the Amazon and the Atlantic forest fruit, suggesting an ecological factor may also contribute to allometry. So we can say that fruit shape is determined by ecology and the species phylogenetic relatedness in neotropical Laurasia. Thank you. I'm Hiroki Sato from Kyoto University, Japan. Today, we'd like to talk about the diversity and the frequency of trees relying on the largest frugivore in a Madagascan forest, implication for vulnerability to Ima extinction. Recent studies have shown that the reduction of seed dispersers led to failure of the plant regeneration and the loss of plant diversity. Particularly, interactions between large seeded plants and large frugivores are vulnerable to extinction cascade. In Madagascar, because the island has been isolated since Cretaceous period, frugivores yield is poor and large seed dispersers weighing over 1.5 kg are limited to two lemurs. Most of two lemur species are threatened with extinction. We have been studying ecology of dry deciduous forest in Ankara National Park, northwestern Madagascar. In this forest, the largest frugivore, brown lima, is a sole dispersal for seeds over 10 mm in diameter. Because this species is illegally hunted and the risk of regional extinction is increasing, we here would like to evaluate the diversity and the frequency of the tree trees dispersed by brown lemurs and discuss vulnerability of Ankara-Fanchika forest to lemur extinction. We established 15 hectare forest plot and identified and measured DBH of all tree stems over 5 cm in DBH. We found 36,000 individuals of 143 species. As median of DBH was 7.2 cm, this forest is composed of many small trees. To identify lima dispersed plants, we used my previous findings based on one year behavior observation and fecal analysis on brown lemurs. 70 plant species are dispersed by brown lemurs, and 23 species have the large seeds over 10 mm in diameter. Then we defined them as plants dispersed only by brown lemurs. By combining this definition with the data of tree community structure, we analyzed the diversity and the frequency of lima dispersed trees in this forest. The upper left graph shows abundance of trees dispersed by brown lemurs and large seeded trees dispersed only by brown lemurs. Orange, green, 
and gray indicate the percentages of the number of individuals, basal area, and the number of species respectively. Light figures shows those special distribution in 15 hectare plot. We found 34 species of tree dispersed by brown lemurs, and they account for 60% uh, of individuals and the total basal area. Large seeded trees of them were only 14 species, but they account for 29% of total basal area. In our data set, we detected the maximum DBH and seed diameter of tree species dispersed by brown lemurs. Interestingly, those two variables were positively correlated. This result indicates that tree species with larger seeds can grow into bigger trees. In summary, large seeded tree species dispersed only by brown lemurs account for only 1% of tree species in a Carafantica forest. So, tree species diversity of this forest is not so vulnerable to brown lemur extinction. In terms of forest structure, 60% of tree, tree individuals and basal area were species dispersed by brown lemurs. Moreover, large seeded tree species dispersed only by brown lemurs were bigger and account for 29% of total basal area. So forest structure seems to be vulnerable to brown lemur extinction. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, I will talk today about how seed pubescence facilitates secondary dispersal by dung beetles. Most seeds in tropical forests are animal dispersed. The seeds uh, pass through the digestive system of the animal and are deposited in the dung like we can see here in spider monkey dung. Um, and then dung beetles will come like these two here and they will form balls like this one here. Now, when they do that, they will often exclude large seeds and allow smaller seeds to remain. However, in the case of this very large seed pictured here, dung beetles, both oxysternin and Canthona anagostatus in my field site in the Choco region of Ecuador, both treated it as though it were dung, and it made me question if there was something other than size that might play a role in how dung beetles are filtering seeds. So this made me question if large seeds that will pass through the gut of an animal are more likely to be pubescent than smaller seeds, um, because the hairs or the pubescent nature of the surface would hold dung and make it appear, to a dung beetle at least, to be dung. Um, and the other question I had was, if this is so, then are large pubescent seeds overrepresented in dung balls when compared to fecal samples? So in the field, I would often look for troops of monkeys and then opportunistically collect dung balls from dung beetles. Um, I, in this manner, I collected dung balls from 82 beetles, and to create a reference data set, I also collected fecal samples from both spider and howler monkeys. I preserved these samples in silica and froze them and then took them back to the lab where, under a microscope, I dissected the dung balls. I also dissected the feces, or actually we dissected the dung balls and we dissected the feces. Um, and then we sorted the seeds by morpho species, so more or less like, you're, you're, like you can see here. And then for each morpho species, we took a count for the number of seeds in that dung ball or that defecate that belonged to that morpho species. And from there, we characterized some things about those seeds, like how long are they? What kind of surface? Do they have hairs? Are they striate? And then for those morpho species found both within fecal samples and within dung balls, pubescent seed species are one and a half times longer than their non-pubescent 
counterparts. And if we look at the first quartile of the data, we can see that there are no pubescent seed species. But if we look at the largest quartile of the data, we do see that there are half of the morpho species are pubescent in the largest quartile of the data. So this does suggest that larger seeds do tend to be, or larger morpho species do tend to be more pubescent. We can also look at how many, like how many individual seeds in the defecate are pubescent if they are in the largest quartile, and how many of the seeds in the largest quartile that are pubescent are in dung balls. 38% of large seeds in dung are pubescent, but 94% of large seeds in dung balls are pubescent. And this does suggest some active filtering on the part of the dung beetle. So I think another thing of biological importance is that if we look at the size range of seeds in feces and the size range of seeds covered by both Canthon and Oxysternin anagastatus in the field site, which are two of the most common beetle species, they cover the entire range of seeds we would expect to find in monkey feces or everything but the outliers. So taking all of this together that most seeds in monkey defecates could potentially be included in a dung ball and that larger seeds do tend to be more pubescent and that pubescent large seeds are disproportionately included in dung balls all of this together does suggest that pubescence does facilitate secondary dispersal by dung beetles. It also does suggest that there might be some selection pressure placed um, on these seeds to be more likely to be included in dung balls because they would get some protection from predation or from pathogens. All right, thank you very much. I really appreciate you guys listening to me today. <laughs>
Okay, thank you very much. I think that's that sounds reasonable to me at least. Um, and I think that I can can uh, say this on behalf of Megan as well. So then there is another question for Juliana, um, and that is about the macros. So the question is about the 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 chicken and the egg and. And you say somewhere that this, uh, if the a large abundance uh, will go along with with sea dispersal effects, and then you have more sea dispersal, more forest regeneration, uh, also in areas of barren land. And the question is whether then you think that this regeneration would benefit sea dispersal, or whether the abundance would benefit regeneration. So it's it's. It's one or the other. Which which is first, or is it just a combination? Um, uh, thank you for the question. I think it's uh, almost a philosophical question, uh, but I think it's uh, both of them. Uh, the distribution of liquor extends over the Caatinga, uh, seasonally dry tropical forest biome, and Atlantic forest too. And some um, phylogeographic recent study of the spawn, of fa the spawn found the genetic difference of uh, subpopulations between these biomes, um, indicating that the Caatinga would be the ancestral refuge, while the Atlantic forest would be the center of the diversification of liquid. And in addition, this palm tree is a source of income and livelihood for rural communities in this region, in semi-arid region. So human beings could probably play an important role in the current distribution of the species too. But liquid populations in agricultural production areas have a low regeneration uh, capacity. Um, and uh, well, as far as you know, the Lears Macau is endemic to the semi arid region. So, for dry forest liquid population, uh, the, the Macau potentially plays an important ecological role since uh, other dispersers would not have the same mobility. Also, the historical distribution of Macau is now, now only since. Uh, 1940, and we don't know how was the interaction in the past. But uh, reports from native people in the Macau region inform that some individuals even die of ranger hunger in seasons with uh, low, uh, low liquor reproductivity. Mm, and liquor is the main food for Macaus, but uh, it is not abundant through, through the year, and productivity is closely related to rainfall. Um, in summary, I believe that both agents of this interaction can benefit from uh, each other, but the liquid seems to directly affect the survival of macaws, while these birds can be important for expansions of distribution and connection of manipulation of the farm, even facilitate, facilitating secondary dispersion by other agents. Okay, thank you very much. And that's it's interesting because there is another species of macaw in northern Bolivia, where it's also very closely connected to one palm species. And so, but that's in this over in this flooded area. So, so that's in in island in a different system, but but the same uh, relationship. So, so that's okay. quite nice. And there is another question from uh, Girard Tercieu to Joao, and uh, and that's that's. That's uh, well. Thank you for the nice virtual poster because that was a different way of presenting. I also enjoyed it very much. I had never seen that before, uh, and and he said uh, or she. I'm, I I cannot see this. Um, uh, the question is about why you use a genus as you uh, to, to define a keystone and not a species. And there is another question connected to this one that that comes in a second. All right, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, the appreciation of my presentation and also thank you for the, the question. Um, yeah, so to answer that, um, one of the things of our work was the scale at we, which we're trying to address the question, which is the neontropical scale. So, uh, and based on 
previous studies, keystones can be identified in several different levels of organization, uh, coming from individuals to species to genera and to families. Um, so given our purpose to identify what, which are the main plant groups, free, fleshy fruiting plant group that could sustain most of the, the fruitivores across the neotropical region, which is very heterogeneous in terms of vegetation types, uh, and no species, uh, very, very few species can occur in such a broad range of habitats. Uh, we decided to focus our, our investigation in the, in the genus, which is also a phylogenetically uniform group grouping, mm -hmm. as these genus share the same, uh, the same characteristics in terms of fruit and could sustain uh, the fruit verse. And another, another perspective of, of the reasons that we chose to work at the genus scale is the application of our findings for conservation and restoration projects. So if we focus on a relatively more broad uh, taxonomic scale, which is the genus that is more broad than species, one targeting to restore a region could select, could have a more variety of species to select from the species pool occurring in that region to apply which species to select to attract fruitivores and facilitate and and yeah and restore that region oh. yeah i hope that answered the okay. question okay okay thank you there's another question on this issue from sergio estrada and he 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 wants to know what is the uh, uh, if you can disentangle the effect of density abundance from the concept of keystone genera and there is, in fact, two things. It's one is, is, of course, there is one species can be very abundant within a genus and the others not. And, and, and maybe he said one could make the argument that any genus of species is important for frigidifor because it's dense or abundant. So the pure fact that it's abundant can make the importance. Mm -hmm. So he asked to, to elaborate on these two different things. Yeah, sure. Thank you for, for this interesting and pertinent question. Um, so, uh, as, as I was saying, the, given this, the scale which we're trying to address these questions, uh, the availability of, uh, of density of the populations, of the number of individuals in, in such a scale is, is virtually absent uh, from the literature, uh, which would be very difficult to incorporate in our model uh, because the information simply does, does not exist. But it's, it truly is very important to, and in fact, the, the original keystone species concept is based on the abundance of, of the species, the relative importance uh, based on the abundance. And it would be much more complete to incorporate that in our model, but unfortunately, this information is not available for the, the, the kind of scale that we're trying to address. So this is one of the reasons. But uh, to disentangle the, the density importance, would try to incorporate that in, in future studies, in, in models. And, but re uh, answering the, the second part of the question, uh, the, the keystone uh, resource concept is not only based on the abundance. No. It has several attributes that has, uh, uh, that has due to, to phenology to provide food in, in, in seasons where the f other food sources are not available for the animals. And the production of a high number of fruits, the fruit crop size that could sustain many, many animals, many individuals, animals that could rely on this, on this, this plant. And also the, the morphological and chemical constraints that could that could select which kind of animal are able to interact with this fruiting plant. So uh, based on, on these attributes, you can, you can be more specific towards answering the question, oh, this species is not only abundant, or it's, it's not abundant at all in this region, but it's very important because of these ecological attributes that make them important to sustain the fruit verse. Yeah, I hope 
the question. Thank so you, you say it, it can be important still while it's not very abundant. Yeah. If, if the crop is, is big or the, the concentration of food is very high. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, cool thank that, you. that you, you do this from your car anyway. Yeah, so yeah, it, I'm, I'm in the field right now. Yeah, I hope yeah, I no, 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 that's, that's, that's great. <laughs> there was a question um, to Juan Carlos, and that's um, about the uh, form of this of the seeds. And so the question is, what would be your insights on the drivers of the rounder form in the Caribbean area? And uh, the question is whether there is a possibility to compare the Fujifor's build size or build form uh, of different forests in the future, so that you can understand this. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that question. It's taking uh, exactly the next steps that we are uh, working on. So there are two things there. So first, we are trying to collect information about birds, uh, not exactly the big size, also the mass or the body mass, uh, trying to correlate that with uh, fruit size and fruit uh, shape. But also uh, looking more in detail, it's not just like the average per species, that was the first step, looking more at uh, individual level and correlate, trying to uh, look more at the biogeography of each species, because some of the species occur in few ecosystems and some occur in several ecosystems. So trying to see differences between ecosystems within the, within the species level. And then that brings us to the drivers. You know, so they interconnect. We have the birds, we have the forest, and, when, and they connect the seed. That is the important part of, uh, of the fruit. In Laurentian, we have only one seed uh, in each fruit. So the fruit is, uh, the fruit shape is completely correlated with the seed shape. But there is also ecology from the seed. So we think that I mean, forest and has less light you know, more shade uh, in the, at the ground level, like an Amazonian forest, for instance, you need larger uh, seeds, you know, than in uh, Caribbean forest, and you can have more open and you get more light, you know, and it's not only the birds, it's also uh, this kind of uh, light uh, and the structure. And that's why it's important to look at the ecosystem level or individual level uh, based on uh, the, the, the ecosystem where they are now. So I can know, Say more than that, I think that is light. What is important, like a resource from the seed to, to remain mm. in the forest ground. But uh, at least in, in Costa Rica, it was shown that shapes correlated with birds. So we want to expand that to see that is uh, true at all different ecosystem levels. Thank you very much. Yes, it, it is always nice that there are more questions to be answered. Eh? The, the, yeah. the, that's what drives yeah. the whole system anyway. So there is a question. Uh, from Lina to Karen and about these your pubescent seeds. And the question is whether you saw these pubescent seeds being buried by dung beetles or whether they are just moved horizontally but not buried. That's actually a really excellent question. Um, it depends a lot on the beetle size. So the really small canthon beetle, which is about a centimeter, doesn't bury the larger seeds usually, um, especially in that first slide where I showed this very large seed and this very small beetle next to it. What happens with them in this case is they get a little bit frustrated because they can't get a piece of the dung that's small enough to roll away and they will fly if they're small. But if they're larger, they will definitely then be able to push it away and it was, I did find it in some of the, the logs that the larger beetles were tunneling into the ground. So the larger beetles will do it, but the smaller beetles definitely not. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I have also two questions myself, and one is, is for Mariana, and that's about the secondary metabolites. So you showed that the four of the four groups, there were two that had a negative effect on food selection. And my question is, and, and the two that have a negative effect, that's what we expect. So my question is, why the other two, the tannins and, and maybe the first one, I forgot the name, uh, why the other two did not have an effect? Um, yeah, thank you for your question. Food. The other one was piperin. And yeah, so it had an 
an effect, but it was not significant. And it's maybe because we are uh, We are something, but the, the, it's now the, the system is blocked. At least Mariana is blocked for me. Maybe the other ones I see moving, so. Okay. Yeah, you're back. You're back, Mariana. Can you're back. Know? Okay, sorry. Yeah. I'm in the field now, so my internet connection is not really good. Um, yeah, that, I understand that. So, yeah, uh, they had a... Um, um, negative effect, but it was not significant. Now I am doing a choice test and they always prefer the diet without the secondary metabolites. Um, okay. So yeah, um, they have um, a ne negative effect, um, but yes. the extent of the effect, it might be related to the detoxification capacity of the bats. Um, now I am looking at if the bats can absorb or not those compounds. So maybe that can give me um, an answer for your question. Uh, but I am uh, working with those samples right now. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. That's, that's interesting. Thank uh, you. I had another question. Uh, I'm looking at, oh, it's at, the, at the question answer, yes. Um, and that's for Hiroki. And that's on the on the on the forest Anthony and the, the effect of the brown lemurs. I was quite surprised to hear that that the forest diversity is not dependent on the on the extension of the lemur, but the forest structure is, and that is against general gut feeling, I think. And I I wonder whether you can you can explain this a little bit more. So why so, forest structure is strong and diversity is not? Mm. So as I uh, I found, yeah. So the, oh yes, yeah, a bit surprised about the relationship between the uh, a maximum DBH of trees and the seed size. This was uh, this relationship was uh, quite new for us, and uh, but brown lemurs can, uh, how say, uh, disperse uh, uh, the seeds of large e tree species. So this is quite how say, uh, uh, make the okay. big impact. Yeah. No, sorry, go on. Sorry, go on. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so so I was yeah yeah. If it's only one percent of the species that is affected, and this one percent one this particular species are having a very yeah. st big structural impact yeah. on the forest, that's that what makes a difference. Then that one, is that what you're saying? One one percent of uh, the species. Yeah. So yeah, you, you said somewhere that, that only one percent is 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 really dependent on the brown lemur, and yes, the rest yes. is not. So if this, yes. if this particular species is very structurally important in the forest, mm -hmm. then the effect will be on the structure. Okay, yeah. Yes. All right, yes. thank you. That, that's interesting. I had another question here from Felipe for Joao. Uh, I, let's have a, let me have a look. I would like to know if you control the site's fruit community structures while analyzing the data. Do you think the density of ecological groups of plant species or genera um, due to forest conservation characteristics could influence their importance in the network? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm not sure if I quite understood the question, um, but I'm, I'll try to answer as good as possible. <laughs> yeah, so um, what I think is that if you incorporate like for each community, each fruit and plant community, the information of the abundance, the relative abundance of each uh, component of the of the network, clearly would improve the model uh, because you you would have the the relative importance of that of that plant species for the interacting community of fruitivores, 
uh, based also on the on the on the abundance, which would give us, uh, I believe, even more power to explain the the patterns that we found because we are, you are all you are comparing different species and population of species in in communities that are all uh, that are all on the, on all on the same scale of comparison because it's ponderated by the abundance. Uh, so it would clearly improve the model. Yeah, that's that's my opinion on that. And unfortunately, we were not able to incorporate that in our analysis. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Then I have the last question because we have, I think we have maybe two more minutes or something. Um, and that's a question to Susanna. And that's about uh, about uh, these three focal species that you worked worked on in 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 uh, in, in, Indone in Indonesia, um, and my question is whether these are the only th three species that you're using in restoration, or what, or that you use restoration with more species, but you just focus for this study on these three species, or are these representative for other species? Thank you very much for the questions. And this, uh, this uh, our study is uh, a part of our previous study. So uh, in this uh, presentation, we observe uh, just for three uh, species because uh, uh, many uh, character we assume that these species have a potential for uh, planting of target area of restoration. Uh, maybe the next study, we also uh, have uh, observed many other species in our study area. Uh, why for this, uh, study we all only three species we observe it's because uh, and this is about uh, the previous study and we have to uh, make clear uh, characteristic uh, about the species mm -hmm. uh, for examples uh, the the importance uh, for the for the uh, ecosystems and for the first time this is the preliminary result and uh, and the next study maybe we have we will observe many other species thank okay you. well thank you very much that's it that's that's a that, that's a good thing to do well, our time is up. We have about uh, one minute. I would like to thank all the presenters really for their nice and cool and exciting presentations. I would also like to thank all the participants in the audience. And I would like to thank Marcelo for making it all possible. And I hope you enjoyed this meeting and, um, and that you also will enjoy the rest of the day. Maybe in the final meeting this evening, which is like a still mystery, something I'm not sure what is going to happen. There will be live music, even in a car. You can dance in a car, so so that's that that's great. But also for all the, the other ones, enjoy the evening. Thank you very much, and see you if if not this evening, see you next year in the next meeting of ATBC. Have a nice day. See you and a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night.